In this lecture, we're looking at Puritanism as it arose in England and as it began to shape the 17th century. And we can begin by remembering what we talked about in our lecture under Elizabeth I and Anglicanism. Puritanism essentially began to arise there under Elizabeth, at least the Puritanism as we know it today. There are always historians who look for the roots of Puritanism, and they go increasingly further back at times to find little precursors here and there, little instincts that could give rise over time to the Puritan ethos. What we're talking about here, though, is more classic Puritanism. We need to begin, though, by dispelling some of the myths or the popular misconceptions about what it is to be Puritan. For most people in the English-speaking world, when they think Puritan, they think of the Scarlet Letter. This group of people, particularly in the New World, wearing nothing but black and buckles on their hats and on their shoes, which, by the way, they didn't do either of those things, <laughs> but often being very dour, very puritanical, as the word is used even today, and really being more concerned about the morals and the conformity of people around them to a biblical standard. The problem, though, is the Scarlet Letter is a fictional account, and it's written in the context of many centuries after the Puritan world. And this does signal some of the problem of defining Puritanism. We are talking about a movement that lasted roughly 150 years or so, maybe even as much as 200 years, that spanned across two continents, both in England and at times when they fled to other parts of Europe, as well as the New World. The other thing, and that's something we're going to highlight in this lecture, is there's actually a great deal of variety within the Puritan world. Puritan is a name that was said of this group of people within the Church of England who were unhappy with the way things were. Therefore, eventually, a lot of people become called Puritan, and even some Puritans take the name Puritan as a badge of honor. But within Puritanism, it's not a monolithic theological outlook, and it's certainly not a monolithic ecclesiological outlook where they all want to be, whether it's Presbyterian or Baptist or something like this. As we'll see by the end of this lecture, those who are within the Puritan sort of ethos or the Puritan stream go a number of different directions but they share a similar conviction that the hesitation amongst those of the leadership within the Church of England was a bad thing. So to define our terms, when we're looking at Elizabeth and then after her with the reign of James I, what we're looking at is Puritanism in general, which should not be taken as synonymous with those who left the Anglican Church and either moved to the New World or who started their own denominations. In historical research, we talk about two separate categories. First of all, there is the Puritan, and secondly, there is the Separatist. A Puritan is, frankly, anybody who is, to a greater or lesser extent, unhappy, again, with the way the church is unwilling to carry on further reforms, or the way that the church imposed and required certain things that wounded the conscience of some people, things like wearing the vestments, certain practices and rituals within the liturgy, and these kinds of things. A Puritan, in other words, could be more hardline, or they could be moderate, in the sense of not being comfortable with certain things, but not willing to lay their fortune and their livelihood on the line for the sake of their convictions. The more hardline are the people that are stomping their foot a bit more, really issuing demands, and at times practicing a certain amount of civil disobedience to make their case known. The Puritan, in other words, is different from the Separatist. As time wears on, there arose a group that we today call the Separatists, again, a wide variety of folks, who begin to, as the name implies, separate themselves from the official state church. Now, it's important to get these categories right because not that long ago, really only about two generations ago, it was very common to see the split of Puritanism as being over against something that we call Anglicanism with a big A. And the old caricature of this fight was that you had high church Anglicanism, somewhat Anglo-Catholic, somewhat rich in liturgy, and then you had the Puritans on the other side, which were trending towards Baptist, Presbyterian, Congregational, and who were Reformed. The problem in this old model, though, is it took a later ethos of Anglicanism as it had developed over the centuries, this idea that it was Protestant and Catholic with a small c, and we'll see this in later parts of these lectures when we're looking at the modern world. But after the Great Awakening and the revivalism of the New World, a number within the Anglican Church, both in England and in America, 
began to tout that they were not part of this newfangled experimentation in revivalism and dispensationalism and other types of things. And they began to tout that they were Catholic in the sense that they were historic, that they embraced the better parts of the ancient and the medieval world as well as the Protestant world. So that's one problem with this Anglican versus Puritan caricature. The other part is it pits Anglicanism and Puritanism as opposing theologies, when really it isn't so much an issue of opposing theologies. As we saw under Elizabeth with the vestments controversy, you see people who have the same essential theological outlook citing the same sources at times to different conclusions. So you have Matthew Parker saying, as a reformed man, as a man who would study with Bootser, that he is in favor of the liturgy and the use of vestments. And then those on the other side are saying, nope, we're reformed, and they're citing almost identical sources. This would signal, at least in part, what the problem is as in defining Puritanism. Historians now, by and large, tend to talk about not Puritan versus Anglican, but Puritan versus conformist. That is to say, at times, people that have the same or very similar theologies with different applications. Some want to conform fully and obey the sovereign and whatever the archbishop requires of people in the clergy. Others are Puritan and are going to voice, in a lot of different ways, their displeasure at this. Well, what's going to happen over the 17th century in particular is those who are conformist are going to eventually adopt different theological positions. But they're going to be a minority at first, and the Puritan side becomes more rigidly, more self-consciously, overtly Calvinistic or Reformed. And so much later in time, you might be able to describe Anglicanism versus Reformed theology or the Reformed world as different theological emphases. But it's important to note that right now, when we're standing at the beginning of the 17th century, that distinction does not exist. Rather, it's a product of the ongoing fight with Puritanism from those who are conformist, rather than the ground of the fight itself. So you have conformist and Puritan, and out of the Puritan movement, you will see separatists begin to emerge, those who eventually leave the church entirely. Okay, so let's go through the history relatively quickly so that we are aware of the rise of Puritanism and its ongoing changes and adaptations within the English context. Some of the things we're going to say here reach back into the previous lectures about Elizabeth, and they're going to reach forward a bit into our next two lectures on James and eventually the English Civil War. And so we're laying this sort of theological story on top of those pieces. Well, as we've said, it began with Elizabeth and those who had come back from the Marian exile, the exile under Mary I. And these folks came back to challenge, they said, some of the more Catholic cultural elements that they felt were still part of the English church. And we said in our last lecture that these should not be seen as being synonymous with Catholicism. To say that merely a crucifix or merely the vestments are the defining characteristics of what it means to be Catholic is simply false. Rather, that buys into the propaganda that's at play here, where those who do not want to put them on are claiming that these things are Catholic, simply because they don't want to wear them, and it's a good stick to beat your opponent with. If you can make the case that what they're asking you to do is medieval, well, they know that they're Protestant by and large, and to do so would at least win half of the battle for you. The fight, though, always turned on the issue of adiaphora. And you'll recall from our lecture about Melanchthon and the Augsburg Interim under Lutheranism, this fight about what are the essentials, what can we all agree on, and what things should be considered, quote, indifferent, which is a word we said would be translated in the 21st century to mean things that are non-essential. What happens here in England is the debate about adiaphora or non-essentials begins to divide a bit. The old model for understanding things that are not essential, as it arose in the Augsburg Interim, was a commitment to the idea that you could participate in things, if required, so long as they were not part of the essentials of the faith. Meaning, if you disagreed with something, yet you were asked to do it because it was part of your, let's say, job description, or because the sovereign of a country was saying, I want you to do X or Y, Adiaphora, that doctrine always said, well, you can embrace these things and do them, even if your conscience says you don't really like them, because it's not essential and you can obey. What happened under Elizabeth, though, is 
increasingly people began to say that if it's not essential, if it's adiaphora, then no one should be required to do them. Now, this is an important shift because what begins to happen is you see an emergence of those saying that things should not be imposed upon them at all at the level of their conscience. The shift, in other words, is Puritans by and large and eventually separatists become increasingly unhappy with the fact that they're being asked to do things that they are not required to do according to the gospel. It's a shift, in other words, about the application of the understanding of adiaphora. When James I comes to the throne, though, and we'll see this in our next lecture, he is relatively in favor or at least understanding of the Puritan method or the Puritan way of life. He agreed with some of their perspectives about the stagnation of reform within the church. Yet he did not agree with them fully about all the ways that they were requiring people to stop doing things because they didn't like them. This really becomes the pivot, you might say, between a good self-conscious Puritanism and some of the excesses that you'll see within Puritanism where they want not only people to not force them to do what they don't want to do, but they also start to say that others who do it have a weaker conscience or a weaker theology because of it. Now, that argument is pretty rare. We don't see a lot of people sort of thumbing their nose, being a bit of a snob about their understanding of the liturgy. Well, James really keeps going with Elizabeth's policies. Any monarch in this day and age is really not going to do much of anything if you push them and tell them that they ought to or they have to. They're certainly not going to listen to people who are bucking the trend and disordering either the church or society. And we said in our lecture under Elizabeth that, that is important to know because Elizabeth will actually slap down people, not for being Protestant or not for being Reformed or something like this, but for the way that they are arguing their case. She is saying, you need to stop rocking the boat. James keeps that same policy more or less going. Throughout his reign, he and his support structures there in the royal court push really heavily for a conformist-style reformed position within the House of Bishops and in the clergy. Those who are stiflingly frustrated about all these kinds of things are not going to receive advancement. He does throw them something of a bone, you might say, with the production and the translation of what we eventually would call the King James Bible. And again, we'll look at that in our next lecture. What begins to occur, though, under James is those who are increasingly unhappy with the lack of change, either from the role of the king or from the bishops, begin to separate themselves, and they even at times begin to emigrate to the new world. So it's under James, for example, that the founding of Jamestown occurs. You also see some of the Puritan or the, what we call in the Americas, pilgrim ethos begin to take shape where people are leaving. Now, it's important to note, no one is actually being persecuted, slaughtered, or killed for their faith during these years. That is something that, frankly, the American ethos has essentially compressed down to be sort of one story. They see anyone coming to the New World in the 17th century as a huddled mass of persecuted Puritans. Well, it's just simply not the case under James. Under Elizabeth and under James, it's either conform to the wishes of the king and the church, or you simply lose your role as a pastor or a bishop. Block the trend, fight against it, and you have selected yourself out of a leadership position. There will be some persecution and some trials under Charles I, especially during the English Civil War, and we'll get to that in a later lecture. But under James, you begin to see this evolving desire to leave the church. Basically, if the church is not going to allow them to live according to their own consciences, or if they are imposing certain things from a cultural standpoint from the Anglican world, again, vestments and these kinds of things, then some under James begin to say, let's go our own way. It's under James that you begin to see some small trickle of Baptists and other separate groups coming out of the established church and leaving and beginning to somewhat covertly begin their own congregational styles of church. But you might say that if James had lived another 50 years, again, just hypothetically, a lot of the real hard-nosed, hot-blooded Puritanism that instilled in lots of people a desire to separate might not have really happened. There were always going to be some who wanted to leave, and by and large, these people were not hunted down and forced to come to the Anglican Church. 
But under James, as under Elizabeth, there was no overt persecution, maybe ridicule at times, but nothing really, really harsh and violent, and nothing that would instill a sense of fear within the church of those who are Puritan and eventually separatist. All that changes, though, when James' son, Charles I, comes to the throne. Charles was raised with the assumption that kings had all through the 16th century and the 17th century, which is the idea that they are an unrivaled, almost God-on-earth level of authority. Now, you have to understand what the impulse is here. The instinct of everyone in the 16th century and the 17th century, until really later in this same era, the instinct is always to say, that order and rule of law are supreme, and that chaos, riots, and upheavals of all kinds are only done away with, or only avoided, if the king is unquestioned in his role. You might say that through the Tudor period and with King James, the accent is always that you'd rather have someone who trends towards being a tyrant than you do towards civil war, fights and infighting, and mob warfare, where people overthrow kings and kingdoms at a whim. So the philosophy, the theology involved here is this idea that God puts kings on earth and that they are to be obeyed because God has done this. They can be challenged maybe vocally, you can speak out, but there is no lifting a finger. That's ironclad from Henry on. The counterbalance to that, though, is it was always known that a king or queen would answer to God for their actions. And that if they were truly a tyrant, if they were truly abusive, that they would be undone, not in this life, but when they went before the judgment throne, they would answer and receive punishment for any of the atrocities that they ordered during their reign. And so by and large, kings sought to maintain order, but they weren't trying to be tyrants. They weren't trying to tell everyone to follow their lead or else they were going to be tossed aside or overthrown. Charles brings a new style of absolute rule to his kingdom. You might say that James believed in the absolute rule of kings. He actually wrote a book or two on the subject. But James is tempering all of his comments about the authority of a king with the fact that God has put him in the office of king. And since he answers to God, he has a higher authority, you might say. And he therefore would always consider wisdom and patience and all these things to be a requirement of the king. Charles, as the son, having probably heard this growing up for years, really just seems to believe that it's his job to tell everyone what to do. You also see emerging under Charles, within in particular the Puritan world, this desire to tell the king what to do, to check and balance him more from the level of parliament and the commons than to just let him do whatever he wants. And here's the thing, because Charles is so aggressively in favor of his own authority, and because those who are challenging his authority and his almost unlimited role of power and authority to dismiss Parliament and these kinds of things, because that group is predominantly Puritan, or at least Puritan-influenced, under Charles, you see arise a counter-theological position within the Anglican Church that is supported by Charles, and it begins to create a back-and-forth tussling between Puritanism and eventually Arminianism. Arminianism, of course, is only beginning to arise in the early 1600s down in the Netherlands. Now, as we'll see in our lecture on this, it actually gets relatively stomped out in the Netherlands. There's not an extensive network of Arminian pastors and theologians. They meet as a council and as a populace, they say no to the Arminian faith in the Arminian church. Within the English context, though, to Charles, Charles actually picks this theology up and begins to leverage it against his enemies in the parliament. And he begins to use it, you might say, to throw mud in the eye of his Puritan adversaries. So Charles I brings about this aggressive anti-Puritan movement that creates within his kingdom, and frankly for a good while thereafter, a tussling back and forth between Arminianism and Calvinism in the English world. Again, all of this is brought about by Charles, as well as by those who are within the Anglican Church who are opposed to Puritans. Increasingly what happens is those who are imposed culturally to Puritanism begin theologically to assert doctrines that are challenging and opposed to the Puritan way of understanding things. So under Charles we have what we call the Caroline Divines, 
a group of people led by men like William Laud, the Archbishop of Canterbury, eventually. And the Caroline Divines are few in number, frankly. There are only a few of them. But they assert a full rationale for a new understanding of the Anglican Church as being not Reformed, but more or less Arminian. And Laud is often seen as a scandalous figure. He had a great deal of power and he had a great deal of support from the king. And because of these things, he begins to assert very aggressively that the Anglican Church is neither Puritan nor Reformed. He begins to assert, relatively speaking, an intensified liturgical sensibility as part of the Christian life. Now, everyone began to challenge him on this, and they called him a retread Catholic. It drove Laud nuts to hear this, but this was part of the dividing line, theologically, that was beginning to emerge under Charles. And we'll look at this in more detail in our lecture under Charles I in the English Civil War. But needless to say, what's going on here is you're seeing an intensified anti-Puritan not just culture, but theology. Then you have the English Civil War and the splitting of the kingdom, the destruction of the monarchy for a short period of time, and the lopping off of the king's head. Charles I therefore dies, despite his protest that he was king and therefore his authority was unassailable. After the Civil War, though, in 1660, towards the latter half of the 17th century, you have the restoration of the monarchy, and you have Charles I's son come back to the throne, Charles II. It's here that the eruption and the breakdown of all these different subgroups begin to spill out of the church. Because in 1662, just two years after the restoration, you have something that's called the Great Ejection. Charles II coming in to restore England to its privileged state as it had been under the monarchy before, essentially wants to slap down any diversity that had emerged within the church. All these Puritans, after they cut the king's head off, after they cut his father's head off, mind, had had their way and had allowed for a great deal of diversity within the church. Puritanism was at its heyday during the Civil War. Well, 1662, 2,400 priests are booted from the church because they will not adopt and embrace Charles II's vision for the church which is, again, more along the lines of a non-reformed liturgical understanding of the church. And so it's from this point on, in the 1660s in particular, where you begin to see a splitting, a real harsh splitting, between those who are sick of the fighting and who begin to call for a weakening of the theological convictions that are causing everyone to fight and to leave and to impose order and all these kinds of things. This group... We know today as the Latitudinarians, the groups like the Cambridge Platonists, and those who extend the issue of Adiaphora even further, and they say, look folks, let's just do a minimal amount of theological conviction, a minimal confession, and let's just focus on being one church. They call for pluralism, a kind of cessation of the concern or the care for the variety within the Anglican Church, and they really make a virtue of a necessity. This weakening of doctrinal or of confessional standards should not be seen necessarily as a betrayal of the faith. Rather, what they're trying to do is to make room for all the variety within their context. They were trying to make sure that 2,400 priests were never kicked out of the church ever again. And so the Latitudinarians begin to soften what it means to be Anglican. They want to create a broad umbrella. On the other side, you have an intensification of Puritanism from this point on, and in particular into the New World. At this point, Puritan and Separatist begins to take on a new word, the dissenters. The dissenters are those who need to be kicked out, those who need to be removed. And it's these folks in particular who flee in masses. They flee in droves. And out of this group, out of this intensified desire to see their particular understanding of the church find space and room to breathe in this world, you see not just Puritans, but all kinds of folks, Quakers, Brownists, Ranters, one of my favorite names, to be a part of the Ranter Church, Familyists, Sabbatarians, Muggles, <clears throat> yes, Muggles, or the Muggletonians, and the Seekers, all kinds of different folks spill out of this intensification as the 17th century wears on because the Puritan movement essentially is no longer welcome 
this purifying desire to see reform within the church, to allow certain groups to live according to their principles, began to be seen not as a desire for purity, but as a dissension, hence the name, the dissenters, from the state church. It's under Charles II, for example, that you begin to see people like John Bunyan, who were thrown into prison for having a church meeting in his home. And all of the ideas that Puritans are being persecuted mainly come from this period. The dissenters are being treated really aggressively. You are not allowed to meet in private. You could not have a dissenting church. And to do so was seen somewhat as treason. And so you might say it this way. Puritanism began internally and it began to challenge things under Elizabeth and under James. You see a trickle of some folks becoming separatists. But even those who were separatists were not seen as the worst sort of lot in the midst of the English context. After the Civil War, though, Puritanism becomes more suspicious to the king and to those who are part of the church. And so legislation and aggression are used to either push them out or to attempt to get them to conform. And so as these decades wear on, you see Puritanism begin to emerge as a persecuted group and eventually as a group that needs to flee en masse to the New World to establish a Puritan ethos here in North America. Thank mm -hmm. you.